Hello, everyone. Welcome to this podcast event. My name is Greg Fontes, and I run the Retention Services Division at Proactive Talent. My duties include overseeing our DEI services, learning and development services, as well as our coaching and advisory services. What you are about to hear is a panel discussion entitled Building an Authentic and Scalable DEI Strategy. And it begins right after this message. Active Talent is the leading power partner to your recruiting engine. We're a coalition of recruiting and talent brand practitioners who provide the necessary tools and talent to tighten your hiring gaps, bolster your retention rates, and embolden your company mission, giving you the competitive edge needed in the ever-changing recruiting industry. With a holistic approach, we work alongside clients to help them build a powerful recruiting engine that enables them to efficiently attract, recruit, and retain top talent. We specialize in adding power to your full candidate journey from talent attraction to hiring to retention. Our clients include enterprise companies like Uber Postmates, Siemens Energy, Boston Consulting Group, Basic American Foods, and GoDaddy, as well as fast-growing startups like Calendly, Discord, and Gong. Please reach out to us today. We would love to have a conversation. You may contact us at www.proactivetalent.com. That's www.proactivetalent.com. Uh, let's go ahead and please introduce yourself. Marissa, we'll start with you, and then Seema, you'll follow. Sure. Thanks, Greg. Hi, everyone. My name is Marissa Huang. I'm currently the head of talent at Playground Global. We're an early stage investment firm that focuses on deep tech and life sciences companies, um, ranging from automation and AI, next generation compute and consumer and enterprise products, really focused on both the hardware and software side. Um, before Playground, I led the talent function at Niantic Labs. I grew the team from 70 to 700 employees. Um, my experience includes exec search, managing talent teams and people ops at um, various companies, Asana, Facebook, Google. And I was also the first head of talent at Thumbtack and Figma. Great. Thank you so much. Seema? Hi, everyone. Really excited to be here. My name is Seema Darinani, and um, I'm currently the uh, global lead diversity business partner at Google. And uh, prior to that, uh, I was running DEI at a SaaS company called Anaplan and um, also heading the women's ERG. I've also spent um, quite a bit of time, about 15 years working with survivors of human trafficking and modern day slavery, fighting gender exclusion, casteism and colorism and the innate need to belong. And uh, so my focus definitely lies on understanding how the trauma of social injustice impacts our, you are, uh, our underrepresented group's capacity to show up authentically at work. Thanks so much, Seema. I am so excited to be having this conversation on today with both of you. You all bring incredible experience, and I know that your experience, your passion is going to bleed through as we dive into an an incredible and critical topic for today on building an authentic and scalable DEI strategy. I don't know about you, but we recognize that for the last year and a half, a little bit more than that, uh, many companies and organizations have really been trying to turn their attention uh, more intentionally as it relates to DEI. Um, there's been a lot of incidents within our national setting, uh, within organizations, um, and organizations are really trying to figure out how do they create, how do we build a DEI strategy that is sustainable, authentic, scalable. And so that's what we're going to be focusing on today. And I am incredibly excited to just dive into this conversation with you all. So with that being said, how about we begin? Um, so the first question I want to pose, and Marissa, I want to see if you can take on this one first. But what does DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, mean to you in the context of building an organization? Yeah, so, so in my experience at various startups, it really means providing the right conditions for everyone to thrive and succeed in the ways that work for them. So that's the key is like in ways that work for them. So this means really actively ensuring that we're providing opportunities for folks from underrepresented groups without ulterior motives or tokenistic attitudes to diversity. 
We also really need to actively remove barriers and just kind of create the conditions for every person to have that same outcome. It's, it's really about just kind of helping people feel valued, heard, included, respected, just all very important things to really thrive in an organization. No, oh, that's incredible. I, I love the perspective of being able to provide the right conditions for individuals that's best for them, uh, because that that requires an organization that requires leaders to really operate in a sense of humility and really in a sense of not being so self-centered, rather being people-centered, really being people-focused, really taking in consideration their identities, their particularities, their experiences, um, both uh, life as well as professional. All of those things are taken into consideration as we develop those right conditions, right? And it's 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 specific to um, an organization, right? No organization has the same type of experiences or is going to build a same type of culture, right? Rather, these organizations are going to build an environment that has those values of inclusion, values of belonging, regardless of the type of, of situation that they're in. So love that perspective that you um, brought to the table. Uh, Seema, what about you? you have any thoughts? Yeah, definitely. Similarly to um, what Marissa said, um, at Google, you know, we define equity by equally high outcomes of access, opportunities, and success for all individuals, regardless of any social or cultural factors. So I think it's it's definitely important to center on that, and um, and basically to really try hard to make sure that equity is a huge focus in in, in everything that we do. Love it, love it, love it. I love the the, the emphasis on, on equity uh, because sometimes we can forget about that, right? We can forget about that. We can focus on other aspects of DEI, uh, but then we when we 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 get down to the nitty gritty, sometimes equity can be you know pushed by the wayside. And so having that intentionality towards that, I think is awesome. And so with that being said. Uh, and this is a question for either of you where you can both either come jump in on this one. Uh, where do you think organizations are getting their approach right in the sense of DEI and developing a DEI strategy? Um, and where do you see and think organizations are, are doing it wrong? I can jump in on that, Greg. Uh, so, I mean, as you mentioned, like the, those last couple of years have definitely been quite difficult. So I'm not going to say that there are organizations that are doing it perfectly. And, uh, you know, we all definitely have quite a bit of work to do. Um, I don't think anyone has it right per se, but so I'm gonna focus on maybe two things that I see that are going wrong and then follow it up with two things that I see that organizations are doing, um, doing right. So one, um, I think hiring a CDO and expecting them to fix everything without giving them a budget, headcount, you know, correct reporting structure. I mean, essentially, hiring someone as the face of DEI is probably not the right move. Um, and then, secondly, kind of ignoring data. You know, uh, data is going to guide us and and help measure what we're doing right and wrong. And um, it's something that comes to mind for me is uh, the exit interview. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I I don't think we, you know, we should still do these, but imagine if we conducted these interviews and gathered similar feedback while the employees are still with the company and then implement that feedback or changes that are requested um, to make them, you know, have a better experience. So, I mean, those two things are, are, are things that I think that, you know, everyone can work on. And then uh, what we're getting right is, you know, I think that it's unfortunate that many opened their eyes to racial injustice during the pandemic when, you know, so so many of us have been facing racism for, for since we were born. Um, it's definitely helped companies though to stop and think and focus less on performative allyship and really dig deep into how they can foster a culture of inclusion and belonging. So while you know the last few years have been very difficult, I think um, the fact that we were in this pandemic really kind of helped people focus. Um, another thing that I think is going right is um, for the companies that are not only focusing on hiring um, externally, but 
retaining and promoting the talent you have within, especially your underrepresented groups. That's great, Seema. Like I totally agree in, in terms of the silver lining of of all of this would be that we're sort of moving beyond that performative allyship. I think that, you know, with everything that's happened and, and, and things that people have faced, you know, every day of their lives, but now that's, that it's getting a lot more attention. I think people have noticed that, okay, like some of the things that we've done in the past have really caused, you know, discomfort in the very least or harm to underrepresented groups. And they're really in a hurry to kind of make amends and, and kind of try to make that experience better. Um, and, and while this, I, I would say kind of like, while this urgency on DEI is really needed, it, it has given a rise to a couple of problems. So um, I, I totally agree with you on the, the kind of single person ownership. Um, it's really hard, like if we really want DEI, DEI initiatives to be successful, it really involves everyone at the organization. So this starts at the top, like senior leaders really have to do more than just provide the budget if they want to drive real change. So um, instead, like they need to be modeling behaviors. They need to look inward at their own biases, cultivate that honest, you know, honest, those honest conversations, um, trust, transparency. That's really going to you know, help them and kind of help them build DEI into the core of their strategy. Um, so I think like that's that's a big thing for me is that if you can empower people to speak up when they notice something's not right and just be open to learning and changing, that's like a big area. So kind of um, thinking about how to not just put it all on one person, because that's not only just a, a lot, but it's like infeasible. Um, the other kind of thing I'm thinking about um, that Greg, you talked about is kind of that one size fits all, right? Like I would say most of us recognize like no two organizations have exactly the same diversity climate. So why would we kind of come up with exactly the same solutions or processes to help improve DEI? So guidelines, workshops, playbooks, that all is super helpful, but it's really up to leaders to get to know their organization's DEI strengths and kind of blind spots just on a more deeper level. So they can really propose solutions, right? That are more specific, they're intentional, they're thoughtful. Um, I have so many, but I'm gonna try to keep it deep and brief. Um, the, the last thing that, you know, some people might find controversial, but really is around the, uh, the business case for DEI. So I just feel like, you know, there's one of the more problematic constructs, like kind of underpinning DEI as a whole is that we often want to back it up with a ton of stats around like how it positively impacts productivity, performance, profit, all of this stuff. But a lot of these stats are, they're super compelling. But I, I just feel like that thinking sets the wrong intention. Like we really need to think of it as central to our strategy because it's the right thing to do, do not because it's just like a numbers game. So those are kind of like the three areas that I really feel like need to change or we need to think of ways to kind of improve it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. And so as both of you were talking, you know, one of the, the, the themes that I've sort of heard from both of you was this idea of performative allyship, right? Performative DEI. How does an organization or how do we know when an organization is not operating in performative DEI? Like, how do we determine that? Who's the determinant of that? Um, because I've worked along with different organizations who are in a consulting capacity where they've been doing things, but certain employees still would categorize that as being performative. Um, whether it's hiring practices, whether it's funding that has gone into different departments and for different roles and positions and, and whatever have you, so on and so forth. So how do we know when an organization has sort of transitioned beyond the performative uh, allyship, performative DEI into the actual relevancy of the organization really being an organization that is socially conscious and aware? Like, how, how do we know that 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 distinguishment? distinguishment? Um. You know, I think that we saw this quite a bit uh, with the racial injustice um, and we would see that um, companies were posting stuff, you know, on Instagram and LinkedIn and and making statements. Right. And and often I would, you know, talk to because I work with quite a people, quite a few people across the industry and I talk to people and 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 some people would say, you know what, no one talked to the to the black folks in the company before putting that statement out. You know, no one, no one checked in on how we were really feeling before saying, yes, you know, Black Lives Matter, we, we support, all, uh, you know, our employees, etc. I think um, how we know that's, uh, that's truly changed is when leadership has that relationship 
with all their unrepresented groups and are able to make that decision collectively. And sure, if you want to post something, go ahead. But but it's not like you're posting something without checking in with your actual team because then it's completely performative. And you know, similar to what um, Marissa was saying before, it's like without leadership's buy-in and without them really leading by example, we're not going to make any changes. It has to DEI has to be the foundation of what everyone does, not just the DEI team, right? So, um, I mean, it, it. I think it would be great to eventually work myself out of a job where everyone is doing my work in their in their role. So, um, so that's where I would think that it would be genuine at that point. Mm-hmm. Got it. What about you, Marissa? Yeah, I totally agree with everything that Seema has has mentioned. I would say that like a good, I, I think it's Verna Myers who who puts it really well. Like diversity is being invited to the party, but inclusion is being asked to dance, right? So it's all about that. Like you can post, you can put whatever you want on there, and and that is sort of performative. But like, how are you actually thinking about like how are we going to ask these people to dance and be a part of this? Um, and there's so many things that are already so you know unfair and unequal. And kind of figuring out, like, how can we level the playing field for folks um, in a way that's thoughtful and includes everyone's voices, right? Don't don't build a DI strategy for people of color and don't and forget to ask people of color like what they think. Like that's just it happens so often that it gave me that real cringe factor. But um, it it's it's something that people don't think about, and and so that needs to change for sure. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Definitely. I, that both of those things resonate with me. Both of them do. do. And, and, and it's leading me to this next question that I want to pose and suggest is, you know, as we're moving away from this or hoping that we move away from this performative idea of DEI, what are some of the ways that we can start a DEI program? Um, what are some of the three steps to, to, to take to build the best program? How do we build that program that's not performative? Marissa, do you want to see, want to start off with that? Yeah, I feel like SEMA has built many more programs than I have, and I've just you know been a contributor on on Looker. But um, I think one of the first things to do is like really identify where you are at, as an organization, right? So each company has its own specific diversity climate that we talked about. Um, focusing on what your company needs instead of what other companies have already done is like super critical. So you can hold focus groups, you can encourage people to share stories, um, look at your own unconscious biases. Um, there's a lot to, to learn from one another, right? To just kind of encourage that honest conversation and really make that safe space. Because psychological safety is like a big component, component of that. Um, you can, you know, a lot of people send out engagement surveys or an anonymous survey to just kind of identify like certain blind spots or gaps in your processes and employee experiences, because that can differ very widely, even depending on department or folks within a department. Um, and so a lot of these approaches will really surface the key issues that different underrepresented folks experience on a day-to-day basis. It's really important to note that, you know, these all require that psychological safety, the culture of trust, open communication. Without that, you, you can't, you really need to start there first and really kind of think like, how are we gonna get there? Um, and, the, and then another big part that's been mentioned around like metrics and kind of, um, just is measuring and evaluating from the very beginning. So you really need to understand where you are on your journey before proposing different solutions and changes. Um, and you can really under, only understand your progress and evolve if, if you're tracking it, right? So use these conversations and the qu- quantitative and qualitative data you collected to set realistic goals and then find ways to measure those that encompass more than just a head count or, or a bottom line. Um, and then kind of the third kind of main component is sort of acting and, and evolving kind of your strategy, right, as you're building out this program. So obviously, understanding and empathy are super critical. You have to have those. But it acting, you know, drives change. So it's it's great to implement new policies and really take steps to ensure underrepresented groups are included. But part of your readiness to move the needle is really your willingness to take responsibility and accountability when things aren't working. So think about like what's not working. It could mean really confronting aspects of your company policies that hinder your ability to create that diverse, equitable, and inclusive experience for your team. Oh, I love that. I love that response. That was just incredible. And what really resonates me was one of the last things you just said is how uh, taking accountability when things aren't working well, 
I think that's one of the things that is so important for organizations to realize that they may not have been doing DEI well. And I think that we need to sit with that. And I think we need to acknowledge that because when we acknowledge that, that brings about a level, a sense of healing for many in, in employees and individuals that work there. It brings a level of clarity and honesty, and it brings an, another, a new level of focus of, okay, we recognize we haven't been doing things well. Now, where do we want to go? And so I love the fact of having accountability when things aren't going well. Uh, Seema, what about you? What, what are your thoughts in regards to some of the steps take to build the best program as it relates to DEI? Absolutely. Yes, of course. So, um, you know, I've done it at a company where I was pioneering it. And then obviously at a company where it's a little more established, but when you're building it, I think it's really important to focus on values. You know, it's, um, whether it's the leadership team getting together, like what's what's important to you? Why are you doing this? Because if you don't have a why and you don't have something driving you, you are you can't continue because this is a long you know this is a, a long haul that we have to go through, and so it, it's really important to identify your why. Um, you know, Marissa mentioned data. That is equally important. You want to know where you start. It's hard to track obviously when people don't feel the psychological safety to self id um i think it's important to to make sure that you're really focusing on why there isn't psychological safety and what you can do to to help people self id so that you can get the proper metrics um you know and then really kind of pick a few commitments that you want to stick to and that you're able to report on you know, like you said, Greg, what are we doing wrong? You know, I, I, if you if you don't know what you're doing in the first place, then you can't report on that either. So, you know, what do we want to focus on? Do we want to focus on increasing underrepresented representation, or do you know do we want to focus on hiring, retention, promotions, you know, whatever it is that that you want to do, and where you are um, in terms of, you know, the 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 general kind of place you are in a company. I think it's kind of hard sometimes when people don't have budget and things like that. So, so definitely if you're, if you're starting off, don't boil the ocean, pick like, even if it's one thing that you want to do right, do it right. If you do have, you know, enough resources to, to focus on many things, I again would focus on, you know, representation challenges, um, you know, creating a stronger sense of inclusion and belonging and um, and measuring that through employee engagement surveys and um, and really also understanding where you are in terms of education. Like, where is everyone on their journey and what kind of anti-racism, you know, educational programs do you need on a global scale for um, that would appeal to everyone and that would help everyone get there on on their journey that's good that's good that's good having an understanding of where people are in their journey because everyone comes in from different perspectives different age geographical locations different educational um, achievements um, everyone comes in at a different place in their journey and so having an understanding of where people are is critical because that then increases the understanding across it actually increases the level of cultural competence that you have because you understand someone else so i love what you 100%. are 100% mm -hmm. and i think one of the big things that and i think it's really the elephant in the room or the challenge that many of us are facing is we're talking all about creating environments of psychological safety creating inclusive environments understanding each other holding each other accountable employee engagement engagement surveys, uh, uh, having an understanding of where people are. All of that's great. But here's the question I want to pose to you all, the elephant in the room. How do we do that in a virtual space? <laughs> How do we do that, right? Everyone's working from home. We have kids at home. We have the city coming to cut trees down in our neighborhood. We have so many things happening, going on in our environments. How do we do that? Because it's it's so easy for us in the virtual space to turn off our cameras. It's so easy for us to just phone in. It's so easy for us to be distracted by other things and to not be as engaged. We may love working at home, but 
it's still a challenge. So how do we create an inclusive environment? How do we drive DEI in a virtual environment? How do we do that? Uh, Marissa, what do, what do you think? How, how do we do this? Wishing you all the answers, but I think, you know, a lot of the, the kind of what you would say is like very basic, right? Like showing empathy and understanding is like a big aspect of it. You know, everyone's having super different experiences from working from home. And Greg, I love how I I'm in the basement because um, the city is chopping down trees in, on my street. So everybody has something come up and they'll, they, every, and, and in those things that come up, you'll have a very likely different set of needs that you need to, to think about. So like parents and caregivers, for example, they may need more understanding around their workload or their deadline and life needs. Introverted people may be really struggling to feel heard in these virtual environments. Extroverted folks may be struggling from the lack of social connections. So really listening and understanding these experiences and really just like very simply asking about needs will, will help employees feel heard and just acknowledged. Um, and then kind of along that same vein is empowering employees to own their work and routines. So this, this involves, again, the trust word. Uh, trust is a huge element of building inclusion in general. And employees really have to feel trusted to work remotely in the way that works best for them. So if that means, you know, working at 6 a.m. while there are baby naps or attending fewer meetings, if they're like really having a, a tough time with mental health that day or that month, that's really empowering them to make those choices without fear of those negative consequences. So that's that's a huge first step in, in sort of terms of driving inclusion. Um, and then, you know, as leaders, like you, we need to visibly model these behaviors and set our own boundaries too. So, um, you know, you can and, and, and should reinforce this in company meetings. You maybe block out your calendar or send an email um, just to say, hey, I, I need to take a mental health day. Or, hey, I'm going to go for a hike because I've had a rough day and just letting your employees know. And I think the more that leaders do this, they sort of are doing that role model like parents role model for kids, right? That it's OK to not feel 100 percent every single day. So those are a couple. But I think that, you know, well, I'm sure that SEMA has tons of other ideas as well. No, Marissa, yeah. you're so right. I mean, you have to focus on on uh, being flexible, leading with kindness and, and understanding. Everything you said is, is spot on. I mean, I, um, I'll have to share that, you know, I have two little girls at home. And in the beginning of the pandemic, I would constantly apologize and um, often put myself on mute. Like every second, it's a habit that I have. Like every minute I stop talking, I put myself on mute. And then of course you have that whole, oh, you're on mute, you're still talking, you're on mute. And, and I was just always just so nervous. And um, they, my, my kids are little, so they, they do make noise, they fight and you know, they, they do a lot of things. And, and one day, one of my leaders was like, you know what, bring them on camera, like stop apologizing, bring them on camera. We wanna meet them, you know, we're all, it seems like we're all going to be doing this for a while and 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 let's just um you know let's just stop apologizing and and bring them in and when he said that to me that changed so much for me because i would just always kind of be very anxious um and uh and you know like you said marissa turn off your camera i mean it, sometimes it's it's important that we avoid judgment when someone's camera is off because we don't know what what they're doing or why they're muted quite a bit. Um, and uh, you know, until we see our leaders, you know, lead by example with this, um, it's hard for us to to really show who we are when uh, we're dealing with something like this. Um, another thing I think that's important too is. Um, you know, if you have things like all hands or or multiple team meetings, you know, not to expect everyone to show up at that time, you know, or hold multiple meetings where it can be um, flexible for people who are on different time zones or or people who just can't work at that time or taking kids to school or or just doing something else. Um, you know, spend spend more time pausing in meetings to make sure that. Um, people have a time to speak and respond, uh, you know, that there's a lot of discomfort in, in pausing. And, and someone was telling me that I think 10 seconds is, is the right time to, to pause to let people chime in. And it seems like an eternity. 
but uh, I think that's important to do. And um, I think in some ways, this physical distance um, is helping us realize that we need to find other ways to connect. So as Marissa mentioned, like when leaders need to just check in on their team and see what their needs are and, and then anticipate that. One thing you brought up, Seema, that was really um, kind of important too, is just around the the times for Zoom meetings. I feel like a lot of times, like, you know, companies may go the other way. They're like, oh, everybody is is working remotely. We need to bring people together. So you know, they might do more all hands or they might do, you know, kind of like Zoom social hours, but they could be after hours or they could be weird times of the day or not fit, even for regular meetings, right? Um, and then it's kind of like, awkward if you don't go. It's just, it doesn't, I think there's, a, there should be a lot more intentionality and thoughtfulness around that of like the, the number of meetings, but also like when they are and, and who's included and, and how to kind of um, accommodate everybody as, as best as possible. And if, it, if you can't yeah, go, absolutely. it's totally okay. And just saying that. Right. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and there, it, you know, I would, when people would have a social hour, I'd be like, oh my God, I can't do this right now. The kids are home. I've got to make dinner. I've got to do this. But then there's people who are really craving attention who don't have their family at home. And so I think you're right when you say that you've got to kind of be intentional about what you're doing, because there are times where people are really craving that connection too. I, I love this part of the conversation um, because as both of you were talking, you know, one of the things that just came to mind for me is the fact that the pandemic working remotely has really shown us that all of us have multiple identities. We have intersections of identities and they came out during this pandemic. You know, for me, for example, you know, during this pandemic, my daughter was born. And so for me, I, I've been many times I've showed up to a Zoom meeting. I, I, I've showed up with the baby carrier. My, my baby girl's in there and I have a bottle and I'm feeding her in the midst of this of this meeting because that's just who I am, right? I can't separate the fact that I'm a DEI practitioner as well as a dad, as well as a, a partner to, to my, you know, partner. I, I cannot I cannot negate those things. That's who I am. And I think the pandemic showed that. And I think that when our organizations really begin to embrace the holistic person, they begin to embrace the person beyond the one making you money, the one leading your team, uh, the one who's just responsible for one functional area. When we begin to understand that, that's when we get to a place of cultural relevance. That's when we get to the place of cultural awareness and consciousness because we actually care about the whole being. You know, we, we talk about, you know, the people operations within, a, uh, within an organization, the, the human operations. Well, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm being a person where you can see the full extent of my identity. So I think when we talk about doing this in a virtual space, uh, that's when we're able to really see the full person because of all of the identities that exist. And so I love where this part of the conversation has gone. So, so with that being said, I want to just backtrack just for a little bit, because one of the things that we did talk about was establishing metrics. Okay, we talked about establishing metrics to help us uh, really create that environment of, uh, of where our DEI strategy is sustainable, it's, it's, it's actionable and what have you, and what have you. So, so Seema, I have a question. I want, let's start with you. Uh, but what are some of the best, some of, what are some of the metrics that are best to utilize in order to track the success of DEI initiatives? Yeah, sure. So um, I think first and foremost, representation, right? It, it, um, and this is where that self ID thing comes in, where um, you want to see where you're where you're at first. Um, and so that you can focus on whether you you need to work on psychological safety, which I'm sure you do, um, by by seeing, you know, what what's showing up in the numbers in terms of representation. Uh, after that, I think, um, you know, tracking hiring of underrepresented groups is important. Um, seeing what progression looks like for underrepresented groups versus, you know, um, everyone else, right? How, how, is, how is that going? Like, it, does it take longer to get promoted? Um, are people being paid less? Um, you know, this is the only thing that you can look at to really kind of see the truth right and and it, it can be it can be very hard to look at but it, but it's important and then um 
retention, you know, uh, where are people going? Why are they leaving? You know, uh, what, what are the reasons that they're giving that qualitative data from exit interviews? Um, if they're going to different teams, you know, oftentimes, um, I believe one of you mentioned this too. It's like HR, people ops, uh, DEI, this is kind of a safe space for a lot of people. Like this is where you see that representation but we don't always have to be here, right? And and um, and we should be understanding why do people want to go to people ops? If, you know, it's because they see themselves, you know, and they see leaders that they can follow. And so we need to mimic that across um, other areas of the company, in tech and product and and things like that, so that so that we can kind of repeat the same thing. And um, and, and to close out, I think inclusion, right? So we want to measure how people are feeling um, by doing these uh, engagement surveys. And, um, and uh, also it's good to see how people feel about the leadership commitments to, you know, commitment to DEI. How do they feel about the company? How do they feel about the leaders? Are they, are they talking the talk or are they actually, you know, doing it? Yeah, definitely. I think that, you know, you touched upon a lot of the, the kind of, points that I was thinking of, of, you know, kind of compensation, growth, retention, like where are people going, right? Tracking their reasons during exit interviews, understanding like what their career progression or journey was. And, and, and that can be very specific to certain departments or team managers, right? Like who, which managers are actually fostering an inclusive environment? Um, and what, what, what's going on with these pockets of your organization where the experiences are so different than what you're seeing overall? Um, and then, and then kind of on that belonging or inclusion aspect, it's kind of intangible, right? Like you, it's, it's a lot harder to measure that versus like compensation and pay raises, but it's really important. So, so definitely in, in terms of your engagement surveys, that's having really targeted questions there. Um, and you can maybe segment these scores by demographic or experience group. Um, you can also sort of collect more detailed qualitative data on experiences if you have a free text field for those who want to share. So those are those are ways that you can start asking these questions and in, in way and in, in hopefully in a way that isn't sort of um, is just really safe for employees to, to think about um, would be would be great. But it is hard. It's a lot harder kind of thinking about how do I track belonging and inclusion versus some of these like very straightforward metrics that are also super important. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think the acquiring of qualitative experiences is critical because that's that's your DEI brand essentially. That's, that's, that's what people want to know. You know, we can look at the numbers uh, and people can say, that's great. Sure. We can definitely say uh, we're, we're, we have a, you know, great, uh, you know, number of employees that are being hired into the organization. We have a great number of them that are in leadership roles. We can be doing programs left and right. But if the experience is not going well for uh, individuals, of, of historically marginalized identities. If, if their experiences are not being validated and that's what the, the language that and the, the narrative that's being portrayed, then people won't want to come and be a part of that brand because it's important for, for organizations to understand that the stories do matter, the experiences do matter. And so with that in mind, you know, as we're talking about organizations growing and organizations being able to track and have these metrics at play, uh, how do you suggest uh, an organization move from a culture fit to a culture add approach in DEI? Marissa, do you have any thoughts? I have lots of thoughts on culture fit versus culture ad. So um, first off, I think it's really important to understand the difference, right, between culture fit and culture ad. Um, culture fit is is often used by organizations to really talk about how it can it aligns with their existing values and culture. Um, and organizations often have a tendency to hire people who are similar to them or who will just kind of fit in and feel at home easily. Um, this doesn't work if you're trying to build a diverse and inclusive organization because it, it, it really implies that you want people to fit in in the first place. And it also implies that some candidates won't fit in. Right. So culture fit is more likely to lead to a more um, homogenous organization that just doesn't have the diversity that people keep trying to, to build. Um, instead, you know, 
you really want to think about culture ad. Culture ad really focuses on the new perspectives and experiences someone can bring to the table and, and kind of how they positively impact your existing team. So it focuses on sort of like the values alignment um, perspective and it champions diversity as a strength. So, so if you think about it from that perspective, if you want to move from uh, to, to a perspective of culture ad, you, you really need to move beyond the idea of using fit as a predictor for employee success. So you can think about a lot of different ways an individual can be successful at your company beyond just kind of fitting into your existing culture. Um, think about what success looks like and the many different paths that, that that could take, right? And think about how that can shape and grow your culture into something new, or, or you know, it could be a lot more exciting or even much better than where it is now. Um, so, so I always get a little bit nervous when people are talking about culture fit and going into this whole kind of um, sort of differentiation, but it's huge. It's like really changing the mindset and how you're really kind of thinking about it, not across just like hiring, but like how you even view your, your existing employees and what kind of culture at each individual brings to, you know, a, a, a team that maybe was a founding team and how you want to grow that. That is awesome. Indeed. That is awesome. Indeed. Uh, culture ad is what we desire, not the fit, right? Let's just make it plain. Culture ad is what we want, not the fit. Awesome. So, so with that being said, um, you know, and we're, we're getting to, to the home stretch of, of our time together. Uh, what are some ideas, right, that we can use in order to implement, uh, to implement in our strategy, in our DEI strategy? What are some ideas that we can implement from a hiring, sourcing, closing, et cetera, perspective, as well as a company culture with its sense of inclusion and belonging, retention, et cetera? Uh, Seema, you want to go first and then Marissa? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think one of the most important strategies is, uh, you know, focusing on making sure you get it right from the top. I mean, uh, helping kind of senior leadership uh, understand, um, you know, what their why is and um, and transition from that checklist view of DEI uh, to uh, a cultural and empowering point of view. Um, I've heard I've worked with quite a few executives on this, and and first and foremost, I think it's important to understand, um, you know, what their privilege is, and um, and then focus on using that privilege to help others. And uh, the only way that you can really do that is if you can be vulnerable yourself, and um, and understand what exclusion feels like, because oftentimes many of these people have not um, felt that way. And, uh, and if you're asking people to hire for culture ad, you're asking them to come out of their comfort zone. And, and this is the same thing, essentially. Like they're, they're doing something, they're trying to understand something that they've never experienced before. So they're completely out of their comfort zone. And, um, and this is the only way that they're going to build that safety because you have to understand what underrepresented groups are experiencing in the workplace. Um, I think it's important to have conversations with their employees, collect data, you know, really connect with people as human beings and, um, and acknowledge their pain. Um, essentially, you know, leading with empathy and compassion is key. Um, I've also engaged with a firm called Leverage to Lead uh, for several years, and, and they work with leaders because um, they kind of th their approach is that, you know, leaders essentially know everything, right? Or they're, they're, they're the experts in everything that they do. But this is the one thing, like their cultural competency is not strong in, um, in DEI. So the goal for, for them is, has been working to kind of build that conscious competence around equity and inclusion issues. When you have this from the top, trickling down, I think that that's where you truly build like a strong strategy. Um, you truly kind of have leaders examine their power and their socialization, as well as build the inner agility to navigate that bias that Marissa was mentioning when you're doing the culture fit versus culture ad, um, and really kind of embrace the discomfort. And I think if you do that, it makes things easier. Um, when you're building that strategy. 
I love the embrace of the discomfort part because a lot of this is super uncomfortable, right? Especially if someone is from a place of privilege and to kind of have that, you know, you might feel guilt or you might just really not understand you understand it conceptually, but you've never experienced it firsthand. And so there's a lot around that. Um, you know, fr from a hiring perspective, since since I do focus on that quite a bit and in, in helping our companies, um, we really talk about providing opportunities, right? Looking in the same places means that, you know, some candidates are never given that chance to apply or they're rolled out due to some unconscious biases at an early stage. Um, so really thinking about like, how can we provide extra opportunities for underrepresented minority groups to get into the interview room? Um, that means you have to think about like kind of where you advertise jobs, how long jobs are op open for, you know, how you actively seek out candidates. Um, you, you can also include like some people have done this and it, it works quite well. You can include an email address on your website or kind of jobs um, page just for folks um, from underrepresented minority groups to get in touch with you um, directly. And if you feel confident, um, you know, answering questions about the role, helping out, um, that's a really nice thing just to say like, hey, you know, we want you to apply, please apply. Um, and just kind of being really thoughtful about that, because it can be very scary, right, to kind of think like, oh, I haven't worked in this field before. I haven't worked in tech. Like that's, it's all about kind of access and democratizing access to, to opportunities. Um, so that's huge. Um, and, you know, there, there's definitely things around reducing hiring bias that, you know, we've experimented with in the past and, and would love to hear um, sort of from Greg and Seema kind of what you think about that. But, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, cool apps that you can remove identifying demographic data, or you can remove, you know, information like colleges or previous um, employment. And that's hard because sometimes if it removes too much, you like can't see anything, but even simply like removing someone's name, right? We've seen tons of studies that um, show a lot of biases, even towards um, names that are of uh, associated with a particular gender or um, a racial identity sometimes. So it, there's a lot around that as well. Um, you know, also just kind of making sure you are thoughtful in your job descriptions. Um, think about how language and skills requirements play a role. Um, if your re role requires a degree from a top college, then you're basically ensuring some candidates without that education level or from a specific socioeconomic background self-select out. Um, so really think about how to be more skills focused and education agnostic, unless it's really critical to the role, which I actually find like nine times out of 10, it is absolutely not like unless it's like a, we need a forklift driver who has like taken, you know, has a certification like that makes sense. Um, but most of the time it's like, I want to know what you've done um, in the past or like what can your skills be applicable to other things? Um, so there's a lot of, um, there's some gender um, uh, decoding tools like Gender Decoder and Textio help with job descriptions, but that's more gendered um, you know, language. It really helps if like you can get folks to kind of read over and think about, okay, if I'm gonna apply for this job, would I apply? Um, and, and some people were super qualified, even at your company right now, probably would be like, I'm not qualified for this job. And so being realistic about that as well. Wow, that was awesome. That was awesome. I love, I just love this part, these conversations because we get so much insight and so much uh, uh, nuggets that we can just take with ourselves and, and learn from. And one of the things I wanna highlight that was mentioned uh, periodically from both of you was really the, the leadership understanding your why. And I think when leadership takes it upon themselves to be active agents, active participants in this, that's where the culture begins to shift. Uh, because oftentimes we have a tendency of putting together a random committee with people who have never done this work, barely have a passion for it, and we never get off the ground. And the leadership says, well, we had an action council. We had a diversity action council. We had this diversity working group. They're the ones who uh, dropped the ball. No, it was leadership who dropped the ball. Let's, let's call a spade a spade. It was leadership that dropped the ball. And I think it's important that when leadership begin, gets behind it, that's where change happens. Because as the reality will have it, DEI is something that we all strive to attain, uh, really having an environment of inclusion, of belonging. It is a goal that we all have in mind, but we can never forget that it's also a process. 
It is something that we must perpetually continue to work at, to work on, to work with each other in order for us to create and develop a strategy that is actionable, scalable, as well as something that is practical and practical and is actually being fulfilled. It's one thing to have a strategy. It's another thing to be living it out. And so uh, for those of us who have been listening on today, we touched on a lot of things. I hope that you all learned something. I hope that you all got some nuggets from it. Um, listen, hey, Marissa, Seema, how can people get in contact with you right after this podcast? How can they reach out to you and maybe want to learn more about what you have going on, what you're doing in your work? How can they do so? Marissa, then Seema? They can email me directly. I'm marissa at playground.global. I'm terrible with LinkedIn. So sometimes I, I go through that once a month. So please email me instead. <laughs> that's that's funny, Marissa, because I was going to say, I'm actually really good with LinkedIn connects. I'm actually worse with emails. So um, <laughs> absolutely contact me on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm happy to, to have a chat and, um, and discuss more. I often talk to people who are building their strategies that they're um, when they're at smaller companies. So happy to connect. Awesome. Thank you both so much for joining. For those of you listening on the podcast, their emails, their contact information will be posted in our description. Um, but until then, we'll see you all next time. Take care. You have been listening to the podcast, Building an Authentic and Scalable DEI Strategy. If you have not already, please take advantage of the resources in the podcast description. They are there for your benefit. Thank you all for tuning in. Until next time, bye.